I think that the sheer volume of this stack of papers already tells its own story. So in my last video, I went through the mathematics part of the notoriously difficult JEE Advanced. So in this video, I would like to cover the physics question, which is my old field of study. In particular, I would like to show you the solution of a question that 82% of students didn't even attempt to solve. So if we start by just briefly glancing through this exam, I noticed that around 50% or more of the questions are related to electromagnetism. And I find this quite funny because I think once you study physics at university, you don't spend this much time on electromagnetism. I mean, it was covered in my course on general physics, and then I had one course in my bachelor that was specifically about electromagnetism, and then you don't really have to think that much about it. But I guess this exam is mainly for people who want to study engineering, where I guess it's more of an important subject. There is a question on gravity, nuclear physics, even a double slit experiment question, which I thought was very fun. This paper also ends with two questions on collisions, which is definitely something that you have to study quite a lot when you start doing physics. Okay, oh God, no. so if you saw my last video, you know that I like to start with one of the easier questions before getting into the question that the students found the hardest. So let's start with the gravity question because that's what I'm the most interested in. Okay, so this is question two of paper two. A particle of mass m is under the influence of the gravitational field of a body of mass, capital M much, much greater than small m. The particle is moving in a circular orbit of radius r0 with time period t0 around the mass m. Then the particle is subjected to an additional central force corresponding to the potential energy Vc equal to m alpha over r to the power of 3, where alpha is a positive constant of suitable dimension and r is the distance from the center of the orbit. If the particle moves in the same circular orbit of radius r0 and the combined gravitational potential due to the larger mass and v c, but with a new time period t1, then t1 squared minus t0 squared over t1 squared is given by, and as usual we're given four different options and our task is to determine which of these options are correct. So when solving physics problems, it can always be good to draw a figure to understand it a bit better. So what they're saying is that we have this small particle of mass m that is orbiting this larger mass. And in the initial case that I just denoted k0, we just have the gravitational force, which is just g times capital M times m over r0 squared, which is balanced by the centrifugal force. And as you probably know, the centrifugal force is just this fictitious force that you introduce in the rotating frame of this particle because that's the acceleration that you need to keep it in this circular orbit at radius r0 and it's just given by the mass of this particle times its speed squared over the radius of the circular orbit r0. So in the second case which I call case 1 we now have the gravitational force plus this additional force that we were giving in the problem that I denote as Fc. And by definition, this force is just minus the radial derivative of this potential Vc that we were given in the problem. So if we work out the radial derivative, we just get that this force Fc is equal to 3m times alpha over r to the power of 4. And the plus sign here just means that this force is directed outwards, so it's repulsive, meaning that it actually reduces the acceleration that we need to keep this particle in this circular orbits at r0. So what we want to do is that we want to work out an expression for the two speeds v0 and v1. So in case 0 we just have the gravitational force balanced by the centrifugal force. So we get that m times v0 squared over r0 is just g times capital M times m over r0 squared, which gives us that v0 squared is just g times capital M over R0. The period for this orbit is just given by the circumference of the orbit, which is 2 pi times R0 over the speed of this particle, which is just V0. So if we now balance the forces in the other case, we have that the centrifugal force should balance the gravitational force plus this additional force Fc. So we get the expression that V1 squared is just G times capital M over R0 minus 3 alpha over R0 squared. And just like in the previous case, we can write the period t1 in terms of the speed v1. And if we now take the difference between these two speeds squared, v0 squared minus v1 squared, we get that this is just 3 alpha over r0 to the power of 3. And this makes our lives a lot easier because if we now look at the expression that we're supposed to work out in the problem, we get that this expression is just equal to v0 squared minus v1 squared over v0 squared. So if we now plug in the two expressions that we just worked out, we get that this is just 3 alpha over r0 to the power of 3 over g times capital M over r0, which is just 3 alpha over 
g times capital N times R0 to the power of 2. And if we look at the problem again, we see that this is just option A. So the answer to this question is A. I like this problem. Let us now move on to what was probably the hardest question on the physics part of this exam that 82% of students didn't even attempt to solve. And the question is the following. A glass beaker has a solid plano-convex base of refractive index 1.60 as shown in the figure. The radius of curvature of the convex surface, SPU, is 9 centimeters, while the planar surface, STU, acts as a mirror. This beaker is filled with a liquid of refractive index N up to level QPR. If the image of a point object O at the height of H, OT in the figure, is formed onto itself, then which of the following options is R correct? And we're given four different options for refractive index and height and our task is to determine if one or multiple of these are correct. So I think that the reason why a lot of students didn't even attempt this question is because it has to do with optics. And at least in my own physics class, I don't think that optics was like, the main subject that we studied and definitely not the most popular subject. I also think that maybe the question is written in a way that is a bit difficult to understand. So basically the question is that we have this object O here and we're going to have some light rays that go from O through this liquid, through this curved surface, bounces on this mirror, back through this curved surface and the liquid, and then it's going to come back to this object at O. And we are supposed to determine the refractive index and some height. Okay, and when you're in this exam with all this time pressure, I think I can understand why a lot of people skip this. And the way to solve this problem is to use a very famous equation that is known as the lens makers formula. As you can probably guess, this is also the formula that an optician would use to determine the curvature and material of a lens to correct someone's eye vision. Basically what it tells you is that you have this lens of a refractive index N and two spherical surfaces. The light rays that go through this lens are first going to hit this spherical surface with a radius of curvature R1 and then the second spherical surface with the radius of curvature R2. And the lens maker's formula basically just tells you how the focal length of this lens is related to these two radii and the refractive index of your material. But it's important to note that this formula is given for the lens being in air, but we also know that the lens in our problem is surrounded by a liquid with some refractive index. So we need to consider two different cases. One is when the light rays hit the liquid and this spherical surface, and one is when they hit the mirror and they are in air. So if you consider the first case where the light rays are just in this lens and in air, we know that one over this focal length given by this lens maker formula is n minus 1 times 1 over r1 minus 1 over r2. So given this figure, we know that our first spherical surface is just this flat mirror. And a flat surface has an infinite radius of curvature. So r1 is just equal to infinity. And then r2, we were given in this problem, it's 9 centimeters. So if we plug this in to our lens maker formula, we get that 1 minus f is just n minus 1 times 1 over infinity minus 1 over 9. But 1 over infinity is just 0, so we get minus n minus 1 times 1 over 9. And we were given in the problem, this refractive index is 1.6. So if we plug these numbers in, we get that the focal length is just 15 centimeters. And this one over focal length is sometimes denoted as P1, which stands for the optical power. So in the second case, we have the light rays traveling through this lens, but also being in liquid. So the lens maker's formula changes a bit because we now have the refractive index of this lens over the refractive index of this medium. And the way I interpret it in the problem is that this ratio is just this refractive index N that we are supposed to plug in a few different values for. So in this case, we have that R1 is now the radius of curvature of this curved lens, and we have that R2 is the radius of curvature of this plane surface. So like in the previous case, we get that this term is just zero, and the other one is just one over nine. So we get that the optical power or one over the focal length is just given by n minus one over nine. So in order to get the answer for this problem, we have to combine these two cases and we have to calculate the effective optical power and the equivalent focal length for that effective optical power. And we can denote this effective power as just being two times P1 minus two times P2. And the factor of two is just because 
the light rays travel through times in this round trip, and the minus sign is just because this radius of curvature switches in the two cases as we saw above. So this is just given by 2 over f1 minus 2 over f2, and if we plug in what we got previously in the problem, we get that this is just 2 over 15 minus 2 times n minus 1 over 9. And by definition, 2 times the focal length is just the radius of curvature, which is this h that we are supposed to work out in the problem. So since we now know that h depends on this effective optical power, if we just plug in this expression, we get that it's 2 over <laughs> 2 divided by 2 over 15 minus 2 times n minus 1 over 9. And if we just work out this expression, we get that it's 135 over 18 minus 30 times n minus 1. So if we go back to the problem, we see that we are given four options with four different values for this refractive index n. So in option A, if we plug in the value of n, which is 1.42, into this formula, we get that h is 50 centimeters, which is also what is given in option A. So we know that A is correct, and if we look at option B, we get that N is 1.35, which means that H is just 36 centimeters, which is also the value given in option B, so we know that B is correct. However, if we now try the other two options, so for C we have that N is 1.45, using our formula we get that H is 60 centimeters, which is not 65 centimeters as given, so C is incorrect. Similarly for D, where we have n being equal to 1.48. By using our formula, we get that h is 75 centimeters, which is not 85 centimeters. So d is incorrect. So the answer to this question is that a and b are correct. So that's good. I really don't blame the students who ended up skipping this question, because I think it can be quite difficult in an exam setting to come up with this, also given the time constraint of this exam. So good job! So if you like this video, you'll probably like my video on the mathematics section of this exam. Also let me know if there are any other exams that you would want me to try out. A lot of people mentioned the 2016 JE Advanced as well as the NEAT exam. Um, good luck if you're taking any of these exams, and I'll see you if you choose to watch another video from me. Bye!